Hello. I want to start with a story from literature. In Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, a character named Mike is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he said two ways, first gradually, then suddenly. Now, that's a wonderful metaphor for how both technology and social change happen. They happen gradually, then suddenly. You know, climate change, gradually, then suddenly. Uh, the revolt against inequality, gradually, then suddenly. But also this world of technology that we live in. So I want to spend a moment talking about why things happen gradually, then suddenly. Uh, first by reference to uh, something that's been in the news a fair amount lately because of the Uber IPO. Uh, think about this idea of ride sharing. It turns out that the idea of matching up people uh, with a GPS-enabled phone was first proposed in 1999. There was a patent filed on it by a guy named Sunil Paul in 2000. Yet when Uber started in 2008, they were just using SMS to call black cars. The idea that we have today of drivers showing up in their own cars, of um, uh, really matching up passengers using that GPS smartphone was really first implemented in 2011, 2012, started to take off pretty rapidly. And why was it that it took so long? The idea was out there. Almost everything we saw was described in, in Sunil's patents. And the reason is twofold. First was that all of the technology was not yet in place. There weren't enough smartphones for the market to have critical mass. But there were also missing types of infrastructure. You think about payment, for example. Well, you know, uh, Braintree uh, and then even Stripe later, we're not uh, out till 2007, 2008. Uh, the iPhone came out uh, 2007. Uh, the idea of actually having apps on the phone, not till 2008, uh, you know, the marketplaces. Uh, so all these pieces were not yet in place uh, for that technology idea that someone had uh, to come together. But there was also a failure of imagination. The very first connected taxi cabs, they knew what the internet was for. You put a screen in the back of the car and you showed content with ads. That was what the internet was good for, right? That was the business model. And so, it takes a while for us to understand the new technology. And you see this sort of jostling progress by entrepreneurs where they invent one thing and then another, and gradually it comes together. And I would like to say that we're in that stage now around technologies like artificial intelligence, social networking. So I want to give you a picture of the big arc of these kinds of technologies. Now, first of all, again, the idea was recognized a long time ago. In 1960, uh, J.C.R. Licklider, who was the legendary DARPA program manager who funded the original work that led to the Internet, wrote a paper called Man-Machine Symbiosis. I like to say human-machine symbiosis now. But it was basically this idea that humans and machines would somehow be connected together and be able to think in ways that we had never thought before. And that's a wonderful description of what the Internet started to bring to us. And back uh, around 2004, 2005, when I was promulgating the term Web 2.0, it was all about the possibilities of the Internet for collective intelligence. You look at the way Google learns from all its users. We saw these collective projects like Wikipedia, vast open source software projects connecting people from all over the world using the Internet. And we said, wow, this is enormous potential. And we were all uh, very happy about that potential. And now, of course, we're seeing some of the dark sides. Uh, because what has happened is that the Internet has connected now billions of people into a single global brain. Uh, things that happen propagate through Twitter and Facebook from one side of the world to the other in literally in moments. And they start to affect us. And we also see 
very interesting intrusions into that space where people are creating bots, you know, false humans to be part of this collective intelligence. And we're grappling with what are the right models for how to think about it. And then we have the introduction of artificial intelligence. And once again, we have a lot of bad ideas that are holding us back. And the first one is the idea from science fiction that AI is sort of a separate intelligence rather than a collective intelligence binding us together. I believe that the AIs we need to understand are what you could call hybrid artificial intelligences like Google that take billions of humans interacting through the internet, add in computer algorithms and bring something together out of it, a kind of collective intelligence. And I want to say that our financial markets are also one of these collective intelligences. Now, here's the thing that you must understand about AI, is that AI is designed and managed by people. And embedded in that are our biases. Embedded in that are the things that we ask it to do. In my book, which I, there's some copies of out there, I compare AI to the genies of uh, Arabian mythology. You give it a wish. And of course, as you know from the stories, we always get the wish wrong. You know, Facebook thought that telling its algorithms to optimize for sharing engagement would lead to a better world. They were wrong. And I think our financial markets also have a false objective function, an optimization function that says you must optimize for shareholder value rather than human flourishing. But I think we can get it right. And I think there is an opportunity for us to harness AI to build this world that we're all here dreaming about, where we are building a world for people, by people, and with technology as a tool to augment our capabilities to solve the world's great problems. But it does mean debugging and refining and changing the fundamental algorithms that we are building into our machines and in particular into our markets. Thank you. Next up, uh, I'd, I'd like to invite Shelley McKinley, who's the General Manager of Technology and Corporate Responsibility at Microsoft. And I want to just give a shout out because Microsoft is a great example of a company that has changed its objective optimization function uh, in recent years and has done a tremendous job uh, becoming more successful as a company because it has started to put human values first. Thank you. Really, it's my pleasure to be here, and how hard is it to follow the oracle of Silicon Valley? Um, I'm Shelley McKinley from Microsoft in Seattle, and I oversee globally our technology and corporate responsibility efforts. And that means I have an interdisciplinary team of technologists, scientists, social innovators who are all focused on one thing, using technology to drive positive societal impact. And so it's my real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about what we've been thinking about at Microsoft and what we've been doing. Um, there is no doubt a very intellectual and very emotional conversation going on around the world about artificial intelligence. Is it good for humanity? Will I have a job? Are people being left behind? And when you look at the words that are being thrown around to talk about it, really you'll see that there are so many concepts when people talk about artificial intelligence, that it kind of makes you ask, does anyone even actually really know what it is? Um, and at Microsoft, we've defined it as technology that can learn, perceive, and reason to augment human and organizational capability. But I always have a simpler definition for things because I'm a non-technologist, and what I think is that artificial intelligence is actually a game changer. So I like to put things in words that are actually really simple for me to understand and for my team to understand as we think about how we innovate. It is a game changer for us to meet the sustainable development goals of 2030. That's what inspired us just a couple of years ago to launch programs in a suite of programs called AI for Good. The first one we did in this area was AI for Earth. Um, it was created by an ecologist that works at the intersection of artificial intelligence and sustainability. We launched it about a year and a half ago in Paris, a $50 million five-year program that puts the tools of artificial intelligence in the hands of people who are also doing that, 
who are working at the intersection of sustainability and technology to make a real difference in critical areas like climate change, water supply, um, agriculture, and biodiversity. Because what we know today, obviously, is that we are facing catastrophic env environmental challenges. While we are not only trying to curb climate change, ensure our supplies, and also this catastrophic loss of biodiversity that we're experiencing today. Um, and we need a game changer to help us do this. So we also can't do it alone. We're Microsoft. Look at it. On a monthly basis, we may or may not be the most valuable company in the world, but Microsoft alone can't do that. And that's why we're so focused on investing in others who are also doing it using tools so that we can play our part and the whole community can come along. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the program in terms of around the world, actually even in Norway. Uh, we have one of our grantees, so far we have about 230 grantees in the program. One of them is working here in Norway that's using satellite imagery, artificial intelligence, to basically better understand the changes in the Fox Fauna Glacier in a place in Norway that I cannot pronounce, but I know is something like Slavad area, but you may be familiar with it, but it's here in Norway. And you, you think, you, you used to be able to measure glacier change in a matter of years. Now we can measure it using artificial intelligence satellite imagery very quickly and very quickly understand what's happening. So that's a real way we're putting technology to work. A lot of the things we're doing are really today are about satellite imagery and mapping that help us understand how to better conserve resources. While we're also working um, to save the planet, we need to work to ensure that everyone's included. And so one of the areas we're focused on is accessibility. It's another pillar of our AI for Good programs. That's also a five-year commitment to put artificial intelligence in the hands of innovators working on the intersection of accessibility and technology. Why is this important? Today, there are over one billion people on the planet that live with disabilities. And when I look around today and I think, why aren't we captioning here? Artificial intelligence is an amazing way that you can make a more inclusive environment. Now, it's not perfect. It's still evolving. But when you look at something like Translator, it's a Microsoft product, other companies have products like this too, um, but you can actually real-time caption a conversation. And that doesn't just help a person in the room who's deaf, hard of hearing. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it, it also helps people who simply are growing older and can no longer function like they could, and they can keep up faster. That certainly would help me. Um, and I can also rewind if I kind of nod off for a moment and then look and see what's going on. Um, so these are the kind of things that not only help people in that community, but help everyone. AI for accessibility is focused in three areas. Employment, because the employment rate for people with disabilities is twice that of people without. Daily life, ensuring that devices work for everyone and communication and connection. And we need to make real progress in these areas, and artificial intelligence can be a game changer in it. Another example of how AI is put to use for people with disabilities is seeing AI. And if anyone um, has downloaded that app, it's available on the iPhone, you can actually scan a, a room, and it'll give you an understanding of what's in the room. So if you can't see, and you want to know who's sitting three feet in front of you, and you actually know that person and have captured them before, then it'll tell you their name. Otherwise, it'll say a man sitting three feet in front of you uh, looking happy and very interested in what you're talking about. Um, and, <laughs> or it can read currency for you. It can read a menu. I know when I go to restaurants now and it's really light, dark in there and I can't quite see what's going on, um, you, know, you can use that to help read the menu. And finally, what I would say is uh, humanitarian action, another important area. You've heard resources are thin, time is short, NGOs have way too little resources to work to solve these challenging problems. So we're working with uh, targeted NGOs to really help them optimize their systems and be much more efficient in what they do when they deliver relief and address critical problems. No discussion about artificial intelligence, though, can happen unless we talk about also ethics and responsibility. Because with this great opportunity comes responsibility. And Tim already touched on that a little bit, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to touch on it a little bit more. But every technology company, including Microsoft, is developing ethical principles. Uh, we released ours about two years ago. 
And now we're working on, we know what we know is the need for a greater transparency on how we implement them. Fairness, accountability, um, uh, security, privacy, inclusiveness, which is incredibly important, so that we develop artificial intelligence in a way that can help everyone. So I will just leave you with, before we get too upset about the problems we have to tackle, we have to tackle them to get the technology to work. I think this can be a game changer, and I think a country that when you put your mind to it and you win, like, is it 39 medals in the Olympics? Um, more medals per capita than anyone in the world? Put your mind to using artificial intelligence to solve world's challenging problems, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of innovation coming out of this country. Thank you very much. All right. We're now going to hear from uh, uh, in a short panel from, with Carlos Cruz Morera, who's the co-founder, CEO, and chairman of WiseKey, uh, Finn Mirstad, who's the director of digital policy from the Norwegian Consumer Council, and Sue Marshall, the CEO of Avodu. And uh, I think also, Shelley, I think you're also back I'm also up there, here. All right. Is that right? Yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think Shelley is here. It doesn't matter. Seats are labeled. Thanks. All right. Well, let's, let's start by uh, hearing from uh, those of you who we haven't heard from yet. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe, Sue, let's start with you, uh, both because you're on the end, but also <laughs> because your company is kind of an exemplar of something that we didn't really talk about, which is this ability of technology to augment people so that they can do things that you just couldn't do before. Yeah, so I'm CEO of Abodu. And Abodu, we believe, strongly believe that everybody has the right to work regardless of their personal circumstances and that they should be assessed based on their talents and their experience. And that's not always possible because you live maybe in a rural environment or you don't have easy access to transportation to get to where the jobs are. So we're actively encouraging companies to think a little bit differently and to think more about where the talent is rather than where their head office is or their corporate HQ and to make work more freely available to people and, and to access those skills. And then on the flip side of that, we're actively trying to encourage people with skills and experience who maybe can't commute or are unable to commute for whatever reason to register on the platform so that we can link the two of those together. And that can help rural communities by stopping the brain drain and, and bringing the jobs out to those rural communities. And it can help groups of people who can't necessarily get into big cities because maybe they're entry level and it's too expensive for them to, to live and to commute there or because they have responsibilities at home as a carer or as a parent. And, or they simply don't want to do four hours a day on a train into London <laughs> there and back. So we're, we're trying to open up a world of work by making it more accessible <laughs> and by making the work environment more flexible. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a, there's a startup in the Middle East. I don't remember the name of it offhand, but uh, I met the entrepreneur in Dubai. Uh, and it's, it's literally doing something very similar, but for women who are in Perda, who are allowed, you know, they're not really allowed out, but they're able to contribute to society and, and find, find work. Uh, so it's, in some ways, technology can let us hack uh, some of the social problems in certain countries. Ab absolutely. And one of the critical USPs for Abodu is that we actually anonymize everybody on the platform. So you only see the skills and the experience if it's a match to your job. So there's none of this one-click apply where you're having to plow through 300 CVs to find somebody relevant. Um, so great for the, the, the time saving. But equally, when somebody is a match, you see their skills, their experience. You don't know how old they are. Um, you don't know whether they're male or female. You don't know what their ethnicity is, what their personal circumstances are. And you invite them to interview based on their skills and experience. So for us, we felt that that was a game changer in reducing unconscious bias at early stage recruitment, but also being quite in improving inclusivity and diversity in the workplace because you're not interested in anything other than can they do the job. Yeah, so let's pivot slightly because we have two speakers who are concerned with some of the negative aspects of what we're going through and obviously ideas about potential solutions. Let, let's start with you, Carlos. You maybe talk a little bit about what you do and yeah. the problems that your uh, you know, company is engaged with solving. 
For pleasure. So, so just to position the problem in the history, the uh, World Wide Web was created 30 years ago. Actually, we celebrated in Geneva with Tim and Lee just a few weeks ago, the celebration of the web. Uh, and I was in the UN at that time, I was chief security officer of the UN, so we actually remember the date on the web arrived. And that was a big excitement because everybody said, wow, this is a decentralized system. Everybody's going to benefit of that. But we knew very well that, that the web is blind. The web doesn't know what it transfers. It was actually designed to be blind. It was designed by military, internet, ARPANET, in a way that it could never be shut down. And that was actually the design architecture. So those things that made the web so amazing has become now the major issues. Because if, uh, if one of the nodes, and this is what Facebook is, what Google is, what anybody is, becomes very powerful nodes, those nodes have a gravity center which becomes so big and so strong that everything else around that gravity center gets sucked in into the gravity center. It's like black holes on the internet. So how, how, we, how we solve that, and that's what my company, I, I created a company which is now the largest cybersecurity company in Europe, listed in the Swiss Stock Exchange, which uh, took a totally different uh, uh, approach. We said, okay, in order to benefit the web, we have to put the person, the human, at the center of gravity. So, so, so it is the human. It's not a computer or your mobile phone or your tablet. It is the human. But the problem we have, the human does not exist in the Internet. The Internet doesn't know we are a human. The Internet doesn't even understand what a human is. So if the Internet does not understand what a human is, we are actually becoming an endangered species. And the only reason why AI and all those tools are so complicated is because they could basically replace us algorithmically into that structure. So you will not be you anymore. It will be you, whoever is on the Internet. And whoever is on the Internet will have no relation to you, and therefore you will be a secondary type of being towards your digital self. And your digital, the digital self, shadow becomes bigger than the Totally. Than, than and, the human and, and, and the shadow has a value that you don't have. And yeah. this is what is important to understand, that that shadow is a product, and that product has a, a huge value. I mean, I, I keep always saying, if you divide the mark, the mark capitalization of the top... 10 uh, internet companies, and they are now representing something like $10 trillion which sitting on the top of the web. The invention was developed in Geneva, which no, nobody made money in Geneva, that invention. They has created a $10 trillion ecosystem. If you divide that by the people that have access to that, each person identity, each person is something like five to $10,000 per year. So why don't we return that money back to the person through its consent? One of the amazing things is happening now, and that's why I'm pessimistic but very optimistic as well, is that new technology like decentralization of ledger, blockchain, allows us as an individual to put a break on that expropriation of data and say, hey, wait a minute, you are making money out of that data, but that data is mine, and I would like you to ask me consent to that data. And that consent has an economic value. And that consent has an economic value for 6.5 billion people that they are struggling. They are poor people yeah. that they have no access to me. Let me so put a little bit of nuance to that last point. Uh, I, I do think that consent is important. But I think it's, very, it's essential to distinguish between people who actually are paying us for our data with services based on it where they're using that data for us. When I give Google my location, it gives me back the ability to do yeah. maps. So this is, a, this is actually a valuable exchange. But when my phone company, for example, takes my data about my location and sells it, they didn't give me any service in exchange for that. Totally. You know I mean, I, I paid them for the service they gave me, and they took my data as well. Totally. And so we need more nuance in that discussion, yep. because there is actually an economy of exchange that's happening with, yep. with many of these but, companies. But, but, but the exchange, just, we have to ask, is, is it a fair exchange? Yeah, provided that you don't exchange with your identity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's absolutely no reason to know Google to know or Microsoft to know who I am. Yeah. I am willing to give to them yeah. what I do, yeah. provided that my PII is encrypted and in, on my yeah. control. And yeah. it's like walking in your house. I will not be entering to your house if sure. you don't have my consent, your yeah. consent to enter your house. Yeah. The consent is a $10 trillion economy has not been exploited. Mm, yes, right. And the consent is the underlying infrastructure for peace. Because PP sustainability will only happen if we are able to retribute 6 billion people the possibility of monetizing their data, because that's yeah. the oil of the new economy. So, uh, Finn, I bet you have something to say about all this. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, so I'm a consumer advocate uh, working for digital rights in Norway, in Europe, and around the world, working with consumer groups and digital rights groups uh, across the globe. And uh, just to, to echo to, to, on the points you just mentioned, I mean, putting a value on data, 
I think it's a very challenging, uh, very challenging exercise. How do you put a money on? It's like trading with a currency you don't know the value of, because your data has a value right now. You get a service back. I'm using Google Maps, but if that aggregated data that I give away over time then builds a profile that says something about me, or at least there's an inference made about me. I have such and such friends. Uh, I frequent these and these places. And um, I work there and there, or I don't work at all. Or you can determine my mood based on my activity. And you can, uh, you can decide my sexual orientation, my political beliefs, very sensitive data. And so if, if I give away this trade in the moment, oh, I'm using Google Maps and give them access for the rest to my phone, I don't know how valuable my data is. Just to give you an example, two examples. If you're using a fitness tracker, I'm sure many of you have a smart watch or a fitness tracker, and that data, if you read the terms of service, you actually see that a lot of that data is being shared with third parties, which you have no idea who are, because they're not named in, in the terms of service. If that means that you, 10 years down the line, are refused health insurance, or you have a higher premium on your health insurance, then suddenly your data is extremely valuable. Sure. If, and we know there are business models like this today. If you also know that uh, there are risk models, this is huge business, um, assessing financial risk. And if I'm deemed financially, um, how to say, riskful, and I don't get a mortgage in the future, and suddenly I don't get access to credit, again, my data is much more valuable than $50, $100, and so on. So as, as much as I agree we should put a value on data, we should also have a discussion that our, deli, our data has an intrinsic value uh, in Europe, it's uh, now a fundamental right to, to control your data. And I, I think as much as we should have a, a market for data, we should also accept that there are certain data uh, that we cannot trade in. Um, so that brings me on to sort of, I think, some of the challenges that we need to address, and I'd love to discuss them with you. Uh, the things we see more and more now is how cons uh, consumers are being discriminated. And I mentioned a few examples already. Uh, we see also the same data being used uh, in, in China, for example, with credit score, with, with scoring populations. We see repressive regimes using commercial uh, services to target dissidents. So there's, a, there's an overlap now with human rights and digital rights and consumer rights. Uh, and I think my, my call to action, being here today, I've heard lots of really inspiring talks today and yesterday, uh, I think we need to have more ethical investments. So those of you who are uh, investing in companies, venture capitalists, you need to ask your companies, do you have good data policies? Do you have a clear plan for not discriminating consumers? There's also now with, of course, new legislation that came into mm -hmm. Europe, what they call the data protection GDPR, which I know a lot of people hate because you get those pop-ups, right? <laughs> The good thing about it is that it gives some fundamental rights to the users. And now there's actually a price tag on not complying, which again gives risks to investors, because the price tag for not complying could be up to 4% of a global turnover. Suddenly, yeah. there is a, an incentive to maybe high, uh, use higher demands. So that's my short-term sort of solution. Yeah. And my, my long-term encouragement is we need businesses, regardless of the laws, to go beyond compliance. I was, and I, I'm relieved to hear about Microsoft here because the prevalent business model uh, with the companies now is to monetize users' data with no transparency, no control. And you mentioned consent. We looked into last year, I'll finish now, looked into last year how, and I have to name them because they're the biggest companies in the world, Google and Facebook. We also looked at Microsoft, did better. <laughs> but how, how the companies... Uh, deceive basically their users by using what we call dark patterns. So that's when you get the consent pop-up. The way they frame your way to consent, the click flow, the design of the service, the way they, they, they measure their words clearly pushes the users in a very specific direction. Mm -hmm. So the, the area of consent that you mentioned is under immense pressure. And who here hasn't clicked yes and download an app without reading right. the terms. And even if you do read the terms, it's generally take it or leave it. Yeah, I, I think the real issue yeah. there is, is that we have very binary thinking about, well, it's either consent or no consent. Mm. And of course, all of the interesting questions are in the gray area in between. Uh, you know, it's either privacy or openness. And it's not a binary question. No. And we need to get better at that, uh, at understanding that this fundamental question is, is the company using my but, data for me or against me? But, Are they letting it leak out? And, and I think one of the things that's interesting to me, and this, I'm going to 
pass over to Shelley because it seems to me that in the future, one of the opportunities of AI is to get more nuanced about all this because these are massive computation problems. You think you're actually trying to figure out for billions of people where the gray areas are and what's right. And, and again, there's a lot of different rules that need to be put in place. And it's not going to be somebody writing them all out. It's mm -hmm. going to be uh, getting a sense, uh, a model uh, effectively, an AI model for what fairness looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. There's this wonderful quote from this guy, Paul Cohen, who was, a, again, a former DARPA program manager. He's now the dean of information sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. He said, the opportunity for AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. And I think that's what we're heading towards. And that's the thing that I love about Microsoft's approach to AI is because I think you are trying to say, how do we use this technology to model and, and manage complex interacting systems? Yeah. So maybe you could pick up yeah. on that. I, I would just say to start with, just offer a couple of thoughts on that. Like, I don't think anybody has the answers to this question. It's yeah. something that everyone's struggling with and, and trying to figure out. I think certainly you know, our approach has been to think through what are those key w things we need to be doing to make sure that when we're designing AI, it does take into account um, differences? Um, and the inclusive principle, for me, I think is one of the most important ones because it is about how do you ensure you have diverse teams that are uh, working on this stuff, diverse opinions, and you have such a great opportunity to actually eliminate human biases that are in the system today um, that, we, that we, you know, we spend so much time worrying about you know, the biases that come with artificial intelligence. And I think we should spend a lot of time thinking about really what the opportunity is on how we can use these systems to eliminate human bias. And there's, I mean, I'm really excited to read your, um, your work because it sounds so, so interesting. Um, but you know, something that we're working on you know, every day at Microsoft to, to figure out how we can you know, up our game um, and up it for everyone else. And that's yeah. why we believe there's a combination of, uh, there's a combination of what can we do, how do we get some standards, um, and there's also, you know, real regulatory um, uh, pressures that are coming, and they're yeah. coming from Europe. I mean, GDPR isn't an accident that, you're, uh, that Europe's talking about this because Europe's at the standard for privacy regulation with GDPR. And um, yeah. my guess, if I were a betting person, would be that um, you're going to see a lot of the regulation coming out of Europe in yeah, the future. I think this whole question of AI and bias is an interesting one because everybody forgets that AI is a mirror of us and it gives us an opportunity to see ourselves. And as we, you know, every time we see, oh my gosh, that's a biased model, we can say, oh wait, we were biased. And now when we fix the model, we actually have to confront and reflect on our own mm -hmm. bias and our own society and, and start to say, build into our models the society that we want to be. And I think there's an opportunity for us in AI to build in our aspirations for our better selves. And instead, we're often you know, building in aspirations for our worst selves. And, and, and that's sort of where I talk about, you know, in some sense that, that we're building it through our financial markets and through many of this surveillance capitalism uh, kind of a model of a, of a dystopian society. And we have to basically build the positive version of that. AI itself can to help detect biases in AI. That's right. I want to pick up a question here from, from the audience. Somebody said, should we be trialing new technology on vulnerable populations? Is the risk of innovation fall, falling on populations who are least protected? And uh, I want to recommend in that regard a, a book by Virginia Eubanks, uh, Sorry, and I am forgetting the name of it right now, but uh, just Google her name. And she basically talks about uh, social welfare systems in the United States and how effectively we've been, you know, you may have heard about the social credit systems in uh, China. She says, look, we've been trialing this stuff in America on poor people for the last 40 <laughs> years, uh, you know, where you get access to services based on social scoring. So we really have to actually look at this stuff. And, and I think the answer to that one is, Absolutely, we, we should not be trialing it on vulnerable populations. We should actually be making sure that all of the surveillance uh, starts uh, with, with uh, people who are very rich and get to buy privacy. <laughs> Doesn't it depend, though, on whether the technology is going to be of benefit to them or not? Yeah. So if the technology is of particular benefit to somebody who's vulnerable in society. Yeah. And there's an intrinsic uh, value judgment on whether it, that it's trialing it is like a bad thing yeah. in that statement. And you that, know, very that's well fair. Could, that's fair. Could be. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Any <laughs> other? 
Yeah, maybe on AI, one, one question. I wrote a book which is available in the reception with the name Transhuman Code. And what the book defends, the th and we launched that in Davos at the World Economic Forum, is that the best perfect AI the world knows and the most perfect technology the world knows is us, human. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely nothing in the market on AI that basically replaces 5% of our algorithm. We have an algorithm we took millennia to be built. The human algorithm is as sophisticated that if it's enhanced by external algorithm, it will get much better. Mm -hmm. But what is a very big danger is to create the algorithm outside that algorithm that the human has. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, uh, the new thinking, and I know in Silicon Valley they have a different views than we have in Europe about this, is it, the merge of biology and AI and, and yeah. creating this kind of superhuman. This is very uh, uh, scary. Yeah. So if we protect the digital identity of the individual and we create an individual that is recognized and respected by the Internet, and by the way, a digital identity, it's a human right, and not everybody has a digital identity. This morning somebody said that 1.2 billion people didn't have a political identity, but this is not a digital identity. A digital identity, nearly 5 billion people don't have a digital identity. If I ask you around this, how many of you guys have a digital identity, and you raise your hands, maybe we're going to have maybe 20 people uh, that have a digital identity. So if you don't have a digital identity, somebody has it for you already. That's right. So somebody has a digital identity. We have a digital identity. The question is whether it belongs to us or whether But it sure belongs uh, to us because yeah. it's your identity. Yeah. How come somebody yeah. else will own your identity? Yeah. Because if that identity is owned by somebody else, yeah. the AI algorithm, which is going to data yeah. mine of that yeah. identity, is yeah. going to take predictability analysis on something that is no you. And that's yeah. a very big danger. There's so a question here from Arnie. Uh, where are we technology-wise in terms of allowing people to enforce the rights GDPR gives? It's a, it's a very good question, and uh, just because we're looking at this all the time. And uh, right now, it's, it, there are tools that you can sub take out your data, but it's hard to put them in somewhere. So you can take your data down, let's say, from your Fitbit, but it's hard to put it back into the, to another Fitbit. Um, and it's hard if you download your data and to see what does it actually mean. So I think we're still... Um, in the beginning. I think it's way too early to say whether the GDPR is a success. I do see, though, uh, lots of more interesting businesses doing business, helping consumers, like, like mentioned here, but also lots of other uh, areas where you can get your data deleted, you can protect your data in data vaults and to a bigger extent. Um, but there's a challenge. There is a, we talked a bit about this last night, actually, and there's a challenge of competition here. Because the prevailing, at least from my point of view, uh, we have digital monopolies to a certain degree. And there was this uh, op-ed in the New York Times last week about breaking up Facebook. And that might not be the solution, but it's really hard for new entrants to come into this market uh, and actually challenge the prevailing business models. And therefore, I think you know, some of the solutions must be regulatory. We must demand better oversight. There must be better accountability. Uh, there was a big company, Equi Equifax, last year that collects data from us. They buy data from brokers and websites all around the world. They collect the data, and then they make profiles on us. They had a data breach, which leaked data of 143 million US citizens. And no one, as far as I know, has been held personally accountable in that company. So there are things we can do, and I think we need to hold companies accountable. And then there are, of course, um, in order to create a more level playing field so companies can actually compete with Facebook and Google. Uh, so I think we have to do that, and we yeah. need to also maybe also get some baseline uh, protections, let's say, in cybersecurity, so there's a more level playing field. Uh, because the risk yeah. here, and we see this through our research, is that there's a low level of trust. This was also mentioned earlier today. Um, and what happens then is that people don't buy the services if they can. So we know that yeah. one out of 50% uh, of consumers have not downloaded an app. They're afraid of their data. So that's a missed opportunity for business. So this should be a win-win yeah. situation here. You know, this is a, a, a pretty interesting uh, tie back to the whole question of what is business worthy. Uh, there's, there's three questions here. Uh, and one says, who is ultimately responsible for ensuring individuals are protected? Uh, how do we, another one, how do we ensure consumer digital rights are being protected when things go wrong with multinationals? Uh, and, and, and then, uh, considering the predatory and addicting model of many online businesses, is there a need to protect us uh, from ourselves when we so willingly sign away our rights? So this is a real question of, first of all, I do think implied in that is there is a serious role for government here to step up 
And government has to start by really understanding technology at a level that it doesn't now. And, and I think that understanding perhaps begins with uh, demands for far greater transparency. It's very hard to regulate something you don't understand. And so much uh, of, of what happens in this space is companies do smoke and mirrors. Oh, this is our private business model. You can't have access to that data. I think government should start by demanding much more access so that we can really understand what's going on at these, at the, at these uh, companies. But I also think we absolutely need businesses to step up and to really put uh, their users first mm -hmm. and to develop, start to develop business models where there is alignment, where actually serving your users, where the data is really working always for them rather than you're, you're always incented to actually work, use it against them which is what, what, what you have in these predatory models, uh, I think is one of the big challenges for the tech industry today. But, but it's happening already. That? I mean, uh, well, one, one of the things which uh, is very encouraging is that there's a new kids on the blog with the name blockchain. Uh -huh. <laughs> and blockchain is actually a decentralizer of power. I mean, you don't even need, go I mean, you obviously need governments because governments is the trusted party. But um, the ledger uh, distribution of trust is a peer-to-pay peer distribution of trust. It's like we're doing human relation. If I trust you and you trust her, it's very likely I'm going to trust her as well because we establish a trust ecosystem. So the trust ecosystem needs to be decentralized. We are in a society which this centralization of digital trust has not succeeded. It's a failure. As I said before, the 90% of the people are excluded from the benefit of that centralization of trust. Blockchain technologies there. Uh, I am working with BRI, Blockchain Research Institute in Canada, which has organized a huge conference uh, with the Canadian government where we are putting blockchain center of excellence all over the world, integrating existing blockchain experiences into a internet free. We need yeah. to build a new internet because the current internet is broken. All right. Well, that uh, I'm seeing the, the flashing red. Uh, we're out of time. I will just close by saying I think we're all in agreement there's a lot of work to be done uh, to, to make uh, technology an asset rather than a liability in the future that we're building together. Uh, but we can make it so if we want it to be that way. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.